You want to turn to Job chapter 1? And that's where we'll be starting. Job chapter 1. <clears throat> kind of in the middle of your Bible before Psalms. Job chapter 1. Most people are worried about the coronavirus. They're hiding in their houses. Not going to work. Not going to school. Not going to church. Events are canceled. Sports are canceled. Lives are put on hold. Stores are bare. As everyone stocks up on bread, canned goods, toilet paper. The world is consumed with fear when they should be focused on Jesus. They're afraid of dying when they should be excited for heaven. They're looking to the president, the governor, the CDC, the news, the internet for answers when they should be looking to Jesus for the answers. They're trusting in hand sanitizer and self-quarantine to protect them when they should be looking to Jesus to save them. So whether you acknowledge it or not, God is still on the throne. We still have a savior. This world still belongs to God, and God's word is still the truth. His promises are still valid in the year 2020. He's bigger than any virus, greater than any panic, sovereign over all. The news doesn't have to report it for it to be true. God's word is still true. They'd rather you panic. A lot of companies make money off of the panic. They profit off of it. The government gains way more control over people when we're panicking than we'd normally give them. And the more you panic, the more you're going to tune into the news to see what they're feeding your panic. <clears throat> but no matter what else is happening, no matter what else is going on in this world, Jesus is still the center of life. And if the world is ending, that means Jesus is coming back soon. Will the news report on that? Probably not. So we'll start in Job 1, verses 20 through 22. Job 1, verses 20 through 22. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I would depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job went through an awful lot more than any of us currently are, yet he still trusted in God through it all. We start life with the same thing, nothing but Jesus. And then our lives are what we make of them. Some people choose to walk with Jesus. Some people choose to leave Jesus behind. Some people go it alone for a while and then eventually realize they need to walk with Jesus. But we all enter the world with nothing but Jesus. And we all leave the world the same way we entered it, with nothing but Jesus. And those who have Jesus have everything. They go on to eternal life in heaven. But those who do not have Jesus end up with nothing but eternal torment. He's at the beginning and the end of your life, but is he at the center of your life? That's what's important. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, and we'll read verse 6. Revelation 21, verse 6. And we're going to read the first part of the verse. Revelation 21, verse 6. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of everything. Heaven, earth, humanity, your life. He bookends everything in this life and everything in the next life. Jesus is always the key, always the answer, always the right path. And he's always there. What matters is what you do with him. Will you let him in or will you lock him out? Will you walk with Jesus or will you run away from his path? So if Jesus is the beginning and the end, Let's look at the beginning. We'll go to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. And we'll read 1 through 5. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The beginning. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not over understood it. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the word of God, the word of God in flesh, the word of God come to life. He was with God at the beginning, the creation of the world. Before there were people, plants, animals, before there was an earth, there was Jesus. There was just darkness and Jesus was the light shining through that darkness and overcoming that darkness, making that darkness livable for the humanity that was yet to come. 
Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, and we'll read verse 1, the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis 1, verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, and we'll read verse 1. <clears throat> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Simple statement, we've all heard it before, but in the beginning, God created everything. The sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, people, animals, plants, oxygen, everything on earth God created. But he didn't do it alone because God wasn't alone. Jesus was there with God at the beginning. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 26. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over all the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Do you notice the pronouns there? They're plural. Us, our, it means God wasn't alone. Jesus was with God at the beginning of the world and at the beginning of humanity. When the first humans were created, Jesus was by God's side. God loves you so much that he created a savior for us before there was anyone yet to save. That's God's love. Let's go to Genesis 2, verses 8 through 10. Genesis 2, verses 8 through 10. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. Jesus was there at the beginning of earth, paradise on earth, the Garden of Eden. God created the Garden of Eden as the perfect home for his creation, humans. And he put everything in that garden that we needed, plants, fruit, water, a river, companionship. And Jesus was right there with God, loving God's creation, because the only thing we truly need is Jesus. And God gave us the one thing we truly needed, Jesus. And we were meant to live in the paradise of heaven with God forever, heaven on earth, the Garden of Eden. But we didn't follow his perfect plan, so we brought the Garden of Eden and eventually the earth to an end. We went off script. We took our own plan instead of God's. So that's the beginning. Let's look at the end. Revelation 19. Go to Revelation 19. And we'll read verses 11 through 13. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. <clears throat> I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. <clears throat> his, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Just like in the beginning, this is Jesus, the fulfillment of God's word, God's word come to life in flesh, <clears throat> bringing God's reckoning to the sinful mess we've made of God's creation. Jesus was there at the beginning, and he'll be there at the end. This, when he comes back, it won't even resemble the world that his father created. He will be judge, jury, and executioner. His robe is dipped in the blood of his sacrifice, and he will cleanse God's creation of their filth of sin and unbelief. Let's read 14 and 15. <clears throat> the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Just like in the beginning, God isn't alone, Jesus isn't alone. God's still on the throne, and Jesus is still his son. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, Jesus is the Word of God. And Jesus will lead the armies of heaven to dole out the fury of the wrath of God. He will strike down God's enemies with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the only truth there is. This is the news we should be tuning into. This is the truth we need to know. This is what we need to spread on Facebook. The sword of the Spirit is a powerful weapon, but if you don't use it, it will be used on you. As the prophet Joel says, the day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful. It depends on which side of it you're on. Let's read verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. 
And that's what Jesus is. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of everything. He should be the president and governor of your life. He should be the CDC and hand sanitizer that protects you. He's the sin sanitizer, the life giver, the salvation that we need. Quarantine yourself within God's ark of safety. Don't keep a social distance from your Savior. He's what you desperately need in sickness and in health. He is the essential thing that should be flying off the shelves, not toilet paper. Forget about the toilet paper. You need to stock up on as much of Jesus as you possibly can through these trying times. Let's read 17 and 18. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair. Come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. At the true end of the world, there will be a feast. And it won't be canned goods. It won't be bread and milk that you stocked up on. The birds of prey will feast upon the decimated carcasses of the enemies of God. Those infected with the sin virus. Those left in the wake of the Jesus plague when Jesus comes back to bring God's reckoning. It won't matter who you are or how prepared you were for the apocalypse. If you weren't stocked up, stocked up on Jesus more than you're stocked up on fear, nothing will save you. If you're engrossed in news reports instead of the word of God, you won't make the cut. You'll be one of the have-nots, burn fruit, rate roadkill, collateral damage left in the wake of the battle. Let's read 19 through 21. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Jesus was here at the beginning of the world, and he'll be here at the end of the world. The people of this world will still trust in their own solutions. They'll actually stand in opposition to their own Savior, mocking the wrath of the Lord God Almighty. They will be led like lambs to slaughter, like sheep to hell, mocking God instead of panicking. That's when they should panic. That's when they should be afraid, when the wrath of God is coming. It's the one time they won't bother to pay attention because it won't be on the news. And it will cost them everything. If you follow a God, lowercase g, that can't save you, what's the point of following? Let's go to chapter 21. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. Revelation 21, we'll read 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for the words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Jesus was here at the beginning of the world, God's gift to humanity, but we destroyed this world. We corrupted God's creation with our sins. We embarrassed our Creator. But some of us came to our senses before it was too late. And God will make things all new again. Jesus will be there with us at the creation of the new world, the new heaven, the new earth, the holy city of God, the new eternal life in heaven, God's kingdom. Jesus is the key to everything, and he's the beginning and the end of this world, the next world, and everything in between. Let's read verse 8. The uh-oh verse. <laughs> But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, and those who practice the magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Not everyone will benefit from the end of the world. So some people should be scared that the world is over. Some people should be panicking that God's coming back. 
because it's not going to be good for them when he does. Hiding in their houses won't save them from the wrath of God. Hand sanitizer can't block out the fires of hell. If you deny your creator, you create your own hell. If you won't give God your life, you give yourself death. There is no more salvation after Jesus returns. That medication has an expiration date. Let's go to chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me a river, the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need light of any lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Originally, God gave us the Garden of Eden. That was our home. It was a paradise for us to live in. It had everything we needed. It had light, trees, fruit, a river flowing through it with the water of life, and it gave us the ability to walk with God in his paradise forever. But our sins destroyed the first garden. But Jesus takes us to a new garden of Eden with trees, fruit, the river of life, restoring all that we lost, all that we gave up, so we can walk with God forever. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was here at the beginning of the world, causing its creation, and he'll be here at the end of the world, causing its destruction. And he'll be here at the beginning of the new world, the eternal kingdom of God. He was the beginning and the end of the Garden of Eden, and he'll be the beginning and the end of the new Garden of Eden, God's new creation. And more personally, Jesus was there at the beginning of your life, and he'll be there at the end of your life. If you haven't met Jesus yet, trust me, you will. You will meet your maker. He'll be there at the end of your life. He's the beginning and the end, but what's really important is what's in between the beginning and the end. So let's look at the in-between. We'll go to Matthew chapter 1. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. And we'll read 18 through 21. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus left the paradise of heaven to come to earth, born into humanity to save us from our flawed humanity. The beginning of Jesus' earthly life was also the beginning of your new life and salvation. Let's go to Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27. And we'll read 5 through 7. Matthew 27, verses 5 through 7. I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong. Matthew 27, we'll read 22 and 23. Matthew 27, verses 22 and 23. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And go down to verse 50. Verse 50, Matthew 27, verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Jesus took your guilt and your punishment upon himself. If he took your guilt and your punishment, your invitation to hell, why would you fear anything else? The end of Jesus' earthly life was also the beginning of your new spiritual life in salvation. Let's go to Matthew 28, verses 5 through 7. Matthew 28, verses 5 through 7. And the angel said to the women, 
Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. The tomb was empty. Jesus' resurrection from the dead was the beginning of your new life and salvation. But Jesus can only bring the beginning and the end of your salvation. The middle part is up to you. You have to be willing to be saved. So let's go to John chapter 3. Gospel of John chapter 3. And we'll start with 16 through 18. John 3, verses 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he did not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. You can be saved. Jesus died so you could be saved. Jesus took your place on the cross so you could be saved. He was the beginning of your earthly life, and he wants to be there at the beginning of your spiritual life of salvation. But you have to choose to be saved. You have to be willing to be saved. You have to follow the escape plan he sets before you. You have to follow the path to heaven that he'll lead you on. You have to grab on to Jesus and hold on tight. There is no salvation without Jesus, and there is no salvation without submission to God. Let's go to John 3, verse 3. John 3, verse 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. In verse 7. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Jesus says, you must be born again. It's not a suggestion. It's not the kind of shoulda, woulda, maybe. It's a command. You must be born again. You can't see heaven unless you are born again. Jesus died for your sins, but your sins have to die with him. Jesus rose to be your savior, but you have to rise with him as a new creation, someone saved, a fresh start, a clean slate, a child of God, a child of the king, cleansed, changed, redeemed, new, dead to sin and alive in Christ, transformed by the renewing of your mind, no longer living in fear, no longer enslaved to sin, but set free and set apart for God. Let's go to John 3, verse 30. John 3, verse 30. He must become greater, I must become less. I'll read that again. He must become greater, I must become less. Submission means giving up control. Listening to God, not yourself. Listening to God, not your fears, your temptations. Listening to God, not the news, the world around you, Chicken Little, the boy who cried wolf. Fearing the wrath of God not fearing the coronavirus or World War III or anything else in all creation. You've been made more than a conqueror, but only if you follow God's path instead of your own. We have to start doing things God's way instead of pushing him aside for our own agenda. And we'll go to John chapter 14, verse 6. John 14, and we'll read verse 6. <clears throat> John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only cure, the only vaccination, the only salvation, the only answer, the only way to God, the only path to victory, the only path that leads to heaven. Take a look around us, folks. The world has gone crazy. This is the end times. It's too, getting too late to be saved if we wait any longer. It's almost time. Time is running out. The fat lady's ready to sing. The trumpets are ready to sound. Look at the things going on around us. Earthquakes in the Carolinas. Tornadoes in Tennessee. Drought and wildfires in Australia. A plague of locusts causing famine in Africa. And this plague infecting the world's population. Causing fear, causing panic, and bringing our society to its knees. All the people are paying attention to is the virus, the fear, the panic. Nothing else is going on right now. Satan wants us to be in fear. Satan wants us to turn on each other. Satan wants us to be distracted. Satan wants us to stop trusting in God. Satan wants to win the battle. But you weren't made that a spirit of fear. 
You are made to have a spirit of power, of faith, to do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are created to be saved, spared, redeemed, belong to God, submit to God, and spend all eternity in paradise with God. If you get sick, you're sick, but with God. If you're scared, you're scared, but with God. Jesus gets you through the storm because he's with you in the storm. If you die, so what? You'll be with God, but only if you were with Jesus in life. Jesus is the, is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things, either your salvation or condemnation, whichever you choose. So Lord God, we thank you. We don't have to fear. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to panic if we trust in you. No matter what goes on in this world, no matter what happens, no matter how many things are canceled, no matter how many lives come to a halt, all we have to do is look to you for the answers, trust in you for the salvation, and follow you all the way home. You sent a shepherd to lead us sheep, and without you we're just lost sheep wandering into danger. Easy prey. But if we follow our shepherd, he'll carry us all the way home, leading us, guiding us, providing for us, protecting us. So Lord Jesus, we put our lives in your hands. We trust in you through these trying times. We trust in you through every sickness, every war, every famine, every disease, every temptation, every sin, every problem, every fear, every worry, we trust in you. So we put our lives in your hands, we put this coronavirus in your hands, we put this world in your hands, because there's no better place to be. In Jesus' name, amen.